A 20-year-old patient is admitted to your hospital with sinus tachycardia and severe dyspnea. A point of care echo was performed and the initial ejection fraction of this very young patient was only 15%. Well, let's have a look at the images. First, there's a four-chamber view in a normal B-mode image. Take a look at the left ventricle. In the center of the image, also take a look at the walls, especially at the apical regions. Here's a more close-up window. You always should implement a focused four-chamber view of the left ventricle to assess, for example, ejection fraction or also to perform strain imaging. In this case, you have even a better appreciation of left ventricular apex. While the strain imaging was also reduced, we thought about first the ejection fraction. This is about strain imaging now. So both modalities, the B-mode image and the strain image, show reduced function of the left ventricle. In this case, the global strain, or the strain of the two-chamber view is only minus 9.8%. This is now the global longitudinal strain of all three views, the four-chamber view, the two-chamber view, and the apical long axis view. And overall, the global longitudinal peak systolic strain is in the range of minus 11.4. So markedly reduced global longitudinal strain, you do see some regional patterns, septal inferior, there is less contraction, lateral posterior, there is more contraction. So the dark red is normal contraction, longitudinal contraction, and the lighter it gets, the less longitudinal contraction is present. The questions now are, what is the diagnosis in the first place? What will heart failure treatment actually do in this patient? What will happen to ejection fraction? We already saw a follow-up exam. So ejection fraction in this case was not only 15%, but probably a little bit more. And what do you expect of strain imaging? Will also strain improve with heart failure treatment, as we maybe would expect from ejection fraction? Well, let's find out in the answer of this case. Let's review the baseline. We saw a moderately to severely reduced ejection fraction of this very young woman with 20 years of age. It was not around 15% as presented initially. It was better already, but still it was reduced. Uh, we saw a reduced longitudinal strain. The diagnosis was made in combination with MRI and it was the diagnosis of a non-compaction cardiomyopathy. A dilated cardiomyopathy, a relatively rare cause of reduced left ventricular function. And here you can see Again, the first follow-up exam with a reduced ejection fraction, probably in the range of 30 to 35% EF. If you look at the apical regions, you can see some more prominent trabecular, but still it's very hard to see, I admit. If you use other views, for example, a peristal short axis view and scan the supraapical region, so not at the mid-level of the ventricle, but even tilt the transducer further downwards in a peristal short axis view, you can see that in the apical regions there, the trabecular displayed quite nicely. Also, where the trabecular are located, you can differentiate in this view. And very important, of course, use a two-chamber view and a three-chamber view, so an apical long axis view, to really differentiate where the trabecular are. This is a apical long axis view, maybe even a little bit more rotated counterclockwise to even display the trabecular better. And you can use contrast, which we also did, or reduce simply the PRF in color Doppler if you do not have contrast at hand to see that there is blood flow in this trabecular, in between this trabecular. This makes it easier to differentiate and point you towards the right diagnosis. Well, a few weeks later, with heart failure treatment, we did a follow-up on this patient and the ejection fraction visually looks definitely better. Also, when you measure it, it's in the range of 35 to approximately 40%. Look at the compacted versus the non-compacted myocardium, especially in the apical and apical lateral regions, and the number of trabeculations. The echo criteria are sometimes difficult to differentiate, but still take a look and try to make measurements or at least eyeballing assessment of the trabecular of the left ventricle. 
When you see more than four prominent trabecles, it points towards non-compaction cardiomyopathy. Simply keep that in mind when you have young patients with reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Especially use atypical views. Move with the transducer more medial in an apical four chamber view to better display the lateral wall of the left ventricle. That very often helps to display it even a little bit better to have the optimal Doppler alignment and to see the trabeculations or pathologies of the lateral wall better in apical imaging. Never forget the right ventricle. In so many diseases, the right ventricle is a prognostic factor. And when we visually assess the right ventricle of this specific patient, we also do see trabeculations, so also this involvement of the right ventricle. And if you visually assess right ventricular function, I'm curious, what would you say? My take on this would be that the basal region of the right ventricle does look normal. So in regards of Tapsi or S prime, I think the value will be normal. But if you look at the midventricular or apical regions, it seems to be reduced. So overall, I would say it's a reduced right ventricular function, not moderately, not severely reduced, but mildly reduced longitudinal right ventricular function. If you use strain imaging, of course, you can use strain imaging also in the right ventricle, you see that the free wall strain, the FWS and the global strain are both reduced. The free wall strain is measured with approximately minus 20.6 or to minus 21%. This is mildly reduced. The normal value would be in the range of minus 23 for young health individuals. The TAPSI is as we expected from the visual assessment normal, borderline normal with 17 millimeters. The global strain is also mildly reduced. So the visual borderline to mild reduced right ventricular function is proven with strain imaging. So now you have another follow-up parameter in this patient with the help of right ventricular strain imaging. In case of left ventricular strain, of course, we performed the follow-up exam too. The global strain in the four chamber view is minus 15% and in the two chamber view in the range of minus 14%. Note that more areas also in this strain M mode imaging are towards dark or more red. That implies that left ventricular longitudinal function definitely improved. Well, why did it improve? We have this improvement not only in ejection fraction, but also in global longitudinal strain. And it improved because we induced heart failure therapy. The only real medication where there's a little bit of data out there are beta blockers. Of course, we gave beta blockers, but there's also data that sacubitril valsartan might benefit those patients. So we put her on a therapy with beta blockers and sacubitril valsartan, and that led to an improvement of global longitudinal strain also in all three views, which then can be summarized that the global strain is minus 15 approximately. So it definitely improved. Also, if you look at the regional pattern compared to the baseline. To summarize, ejection fraction is mentioned in the guidelines, of course, to follow up patients in regards of improvement in heart failure. But global longitudinal strain gives a lot of important information. It's an early marker, as well as the right ventricular strain. It's an early marker of reduced function and it's a prognostic marker. In non-compaction cardiomyopathy, we do have very limited data as it is a very rare disease entity. But this case exemplifies that we can benefit or we can, this case so nicely exemplifies that imaging is the key to follow up the patients, use new modalities, not only ejection fraction, but also global longitudinal strain, and try to induce heart failure therapy the patient overall clinically feels entirely fine with the New York Heart Association class in between one to probably two.